The following is a presentation of VBR. Welcome, and thank you for joining us in our study of God's Holy Word. Welcome to Video Bible Readings. This is a Bible study series on the New Testament, and this project was inspired by the Bible readings conducted in many congregations years ago. They were open to everyone, and the attendees read and studied the Bible intensively for weeks at a time, often in the winter months. The Bible readings of yesteryear resulted in considerable spiritual growth as people let the Bible soak into their minds. We no longer live in the agrarian society that facilitated that collective Bible reading experience. So our video Bible readings were conceived as a modern alternative, accessible anytime. Our purpose is to promote personal Bible study. Our purpose is not to substitute for any Bible study that you may do otherwise. Our purpose is definitely not to take the place of the mutual edification of the church when it assembles together. But we do hope that you will be built up in the faith as a result of this series. I've been asked to read and comment on the book of 1 John. I'll be reading from the King James Version of the Bible. And I've woven together some thoughts gleaned from various sources in an effort to edify. Very little that I ever say is original with me, but I hope that everything I say is true. If you hear me say anything that's not true, I hope you'll let me know so that I can correct it. I love the truth and I want to follow truth wherever it leads. We welcome you, we thank you for sharing with us in our video Bible readings. Let me briefly introduce the book of 1 John. The Apostle John was one of the inner circle of three apostles along with Peter and James. He's a familiar figure in most of the scenes of the New Testament with Jesus and his disciples. The image that many people have of the Apostle John is probably not quite what he was really like. Paintings of the past have made him appear to be pale and quiet, dove-eyed and even effeminate. In Da Vinci's The Last Supper, he's sometimes been mistaken for a girl. But John was outgoing and at times almost volatile. John was emotional and could be quite demanding. His writing is bold and direct and dogmatic. I don't think there's another New Testament author as dogmatic as the Apostle John. He's authoritative in his writing. He's committed to absolutes. He is black and white. John is an exclusive preacher needed in our inclusive time. As an authoritative apostle, he's the perfect writer to address the church today. John writes in simple words. He writes in clear certainties. Nothing here is vague, nothing here is ambiguous. And John can bring a new sense of certainty to us. If we're already certain, he'll make us that much stronger in our certainty. John never identifies himself as the author of this letter, but we have the strong, consistent, and universal testimony of the early church that he wrote it. There were people who knew John and knew that he wrote it. They told their friends and fellow believers that he wrote it, and this was passed down from John's generation to the next generation and the generation after that. John's authorship can be traced all the way back to people who knew John. John lived the longest of all the apostles, almost till the end of the first century. We have a very strong foundation for his authorship. Papias in the generation after John knew John personally and called him a living and abiding voice for God. As the last apostle standing, the apostle John didn't really need to sign his work. Everybody knew who he was and they knew what he wrote. One time they say Picasso finished a painting and somebody said, aren't you going to sign it? He looked at the painting and said, it's signed. And I feel like that with the apostle John where this letter is concerned. It's consistent with John not to refer to himself by name. In his gospel, he doesn't use his name. Well, actually, in his gospel, he does use his name, but he's not talking about himself. When he says there was a man sent from God whose name was John, he's referring to John the Immerser and not to himself, John the Apostle. 
He refers to himself by descriptive phrases, like the disciple whom Jesus loved. He refers to himself as the one who reclined near Jesus at the Last Supper. There's a measure of humility in this. He was self-effacing in that regard. He portrayed himself as an intimate and beloved companion of Jesus. So when we don't see John's name in his letters, we're not surprised because we don't see his name in his gospel. In 1 John, God is mentioned and Jesus is mentioned, but there's only one other proper name used in 1 John. Do you know who it is? Keep listening, and when we get there, I'll try to remember to remind us that that's the only other proper name besides Jesus and God in the entire epistle. Probably the gospel and the epistles of John were written at about the same time. They were written with a similar vocabulary. They were written to combat a single heresy, which was in the process of becoming Gnosticism. So we have a common authorship confronting a common problem at a common time, the latter third of the first century. The book of Revelation was probably written about 96 AD and mentions the Domitian persecution. The gospel and the letters don't mention that persecution and were probably written a while before it. John was probably an elder in the church at Ephesus. Jerusalem had been destroyed in 70 AD. 985 villages and towns had felt the slaughtering power of Rome. This sole surviving apostle wraps up the writing of the New Testament. Interestingly, we don't have even one of John's oral sermons in the New Testament like we have from Peter or Paul. But John was the last contributor to divine revelation. John was at Ephesus. Decades earlier, Paul had told the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, I know that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. So Paul was telling them you need to be on the alert. You need to get in a protective mode because you've been entrusted with the church of God. Paul says there, I know. This is the language of certainty, the language of revelation. Paul was giving a prophecy, and now John is writing to combat teaching that is the fulfillment of that prophecy. False teachers sowed seeds of error at Ephesus, questioning the fundamentals of the Christian faith, questioning the relationship between the deity and the humanity of Jesus, questioning who really is a Christian. John is writing in clear and unambiguous terms about the insidious inroads of false doctrine. The two major realities in the spiritual realm are truth and love. These are the compelling realities, truth and love. Paul says, speak the truth in love. Truth proclaimed in love. That's the balance that we're after. It's not enough to have the love and leave out the truth, but we don't want unloving, self-righteous orthodoxy either. Christ is the perfect image of truth and love in balance. Know the truth as God reveals it, and then love as Christ loves. John is a marvelous example of this. He used to be a son of thunder. He wanted to call down fire from heaven. He manifested a self-promoting ambition. John, at one point in his life, wanted special privilege and honor to sit on the right hand or the left hand. The only time recorded that he speaks up in, in the Gospels is in the ninth chapter of the book of Mark. Mark 9, 38, when he says, we saw somebody casting out demons and we tried to stop him because he wasn't following with us. And the Lord's message to John through all of this, all of this self-promotion is, stop trying to be in charge, John. You need to start being last. You need to learn how to be a servant. You need to become like a little child. John was wired to burn the Samaritans. He wanted to be the chief. He wanted to shut up people that he didn't think were worthy. He had a real competitive spirit. John has the ability to be narrow, dogmatic, exclusive, and draw a hard line. And that's usable if it's for the right things. That's the kind of man who can be shaped into strength. What the Lord needed to do was make this man loving 
And I think he succeeded in doing that. That critical rebuke in Mark chapter 9 perhaps pushed John toward being loving. There was nothing vague in John's world, but it needed to be tempered with love. And John did become the apostle of love with an unwavering regard for truth. Everything in John is absolute. There's the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the devil. There are the children of God and the children of the devil. There's light and there's dark. There's righteousness and there's wickedness. There's salvation and damnation. But John's love never slides into sentimentality. He never tolerated lies. He never tolerated sin. The most powerful advocate of truth gives a powerful representation of love. The most clear-cut black and white writer in the New Testament is known as the apostle love of love, and he doesn't come across as harsh. Speaking the truth in love is the most loving thing that we can do. John received the love of the truth, and he never let it go. He says in chapter 1, verse 4, I write these things that your joy may be full. A study of 1 John should increase our joy. He says in chapter 2, verse 1, I write these things to you that you may not sin. Here was a man who had heard his Lord say, go and sin no more. His second purpose in writing this book is to produce holiness in his readers. And then he says in chapter 5, verse 13, I have written these things to you that you may know that you have eternal life. This verse is key to the letter. I want to eliminate your sadness, your sin, and your doubt. I want to bring you joy, I want to bring you holiness, and I want to bring you assurance. A study of 1 John does bring us joy. It helps us to turn more readily and more eagerly from sin. It gives us the assurance of eternal life. Those are the purposes for which the Spirit of God inspired this letter. So as we sit at the feet of this beloved old man, we find that as we look at 1 John, there are no truly introductory statements here. Not only is there no identification of the author, there are no greetings. This is so unlike the letters of Paul or Peter or James. John jumps immediately into the issue. I had a biology professor one time who gave essay tests, and he said, now when you're answering these essay questions, if you feel the need to write an introductory paragraph, go ahead and write it, but then throw it away. I don't want it. All I want is the meat. But if you feel like you need an introduction, write it. I don't ever want to see it. And I did try that, and it did seem like I could get to the meat easier that way by writing an introduction. The Apostle John reminds me of that here. He goes right into the meat. So having said that, I'll read what can pass as the only introduction that the book has. Let's read chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This is about the word of life. John says, I'm writing from personal experience. I've seen it, I've heard it, I've scrutinized it, I have handled it with my own hands. John is writing as an eyewitness, as the last living apostle in the last decades of the first century. The word of life was manifested, and what we've seen and heard, we proclaim to you. This is firsthand eyewitness truth. The churches to whom John was writing had been subjected to error. It was John's apostolic duty to confront that error with the truth. The greatest reality the world possesses is divine truth. The greatest threat in the world are any ideas contrary to that truth. We have the responsibility to proclaim truth and point out error. The spiritual warfare is between truth and error. It's always been this way. Satan told Eve that what God told her was wrong. 
It's always been the truth of God against the lies of demons and men. So just 50 or 60 years after the church was established, the truth was under massive assault. The first assault on the truth had come from the legalism of Judaism, but the second that came later was from the philosophy of the Greeks. Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, and Eusebius tell us that John was in Ephesus, and Ephesus was the philosophic center of Asia Minor. The church there was founded by Paul, who spent years there. 1 John is a polemical letter dealing with controversy and designed to arm us to deal with error. There are probably as many negative statements as there are positive statements in it, but there is a tone of positive affirmation sweeping through it. John wants us to know who we are. He wants non-Christians to know who they are. Many false prophets are gone out into the world. They always infiltrate unwary and unprotected churches. By this epistle, a sorting out is made. It has immense edification within it, and it should have an impact on our spiritual development. John had zero tolerance for error, and there's nothing vague here. Everything he says has a ring of clarity and precision to it. This is different from the writing of Paul. Paul deals with nuance. Paul deals with quite a number of exceptions. But almost the only time the Apostle John gives an exception is in chapter 2, verse 1. He says, I'm writing these things to you that you do not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. John learned love from the Lord. He says we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So out of love, he gives us truth. And we experience that truth as we learn that love. John is very warm, he's very personal, and he's very conversational in his writing. Paul sometimes sounds like a lawyer making a case, but John writes more like a father to his beloved family. Paul has flowing arguments that proceed from point to point to point. But here in 1 John, we don't find a logical argument that flows from the beginning of the epistle to the end. Rather, John is conversational. John circles back through the same things again and again, like a father teaching his children with repetition, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. 1 John is probably the most challenging of all the New Testament books to outline for this very reason. There is not a systematic flow, rather it's a series of circles. In fact, if we think of it that way, as a series of ever-widening concentric circles, we'll be tuning in to the real message of the book. Sometimes he circles back through the same series of thought four different times, but each time he goes a little wider and he goes a little deeper, that these truths may be driven deeply into the hearts of his beloved children. Paul's been gone for decades. John has the last word. Somebody said it's like the wine at the wedding in Cana of Galilee. The best wine is last. But I don't think you and I need to decide who's best between Paul and John. They're both good. They're both writing by inspiration. My only point here is that we can sure see the difference. I think a brief contrast is in order between John's gospel and the epistle we're studying. In the gospel, he's writing for unbelievers. These are written that you might believe, he said. The purpose of John's gospel was evangelistic. The epistle was written for believers to deepen their confidence and their assurance. So the gospel was given so people could receive life, and the epistle was given so they could enjoy fully the life that they've already received. The gospel contains signs that evoke faith, and the epistle contains tests that verify faith. The enemies of the truth in the gospel were the unbelieving Jews. The enemies of the truth in the epistle are professing Christians led astray by false teachers. The truth has enemies both inside and outside of the professing church. The error taught by those in the church can be perceived by reading this epistle. The error that they taught was concerning the word, the living word of God. 
False prophets often want to deny who Jesus Christ really is. And if you believe in the wrong Christ, then you can't be saved. Antichrist is anyone who tampers with the true nature, person, and work of Jesus Christ. In chapter 1, as we look at it, we'll see that in verse 6, 8, and 10, the Apostle John says, if we say, if we say, if we say, that's reflective of what the false teachers were saying. They said they didn't sin, and they tried to shore up that argument by redefining what sin was. They said that you could love God and hate other people. How many times did John say, he's a liar when he says that? John is just so blunt. These false teachers looked down with disdain on anybody who wasn't part of their elite philosophical religious group. They thought they had a secret knowledge or gnosis, hence the name Gnostic. They were above the hoi polloi as they viewed themselves. The Apostle Paul had said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, that we want to deal with every lofty thing that raises itself up against the knowledge of God and tear it down. All this high thinking by which man elevates himself. And here in our time, we've had the New Age movement and all sorts of mysticism related to it. In mysticism, you invent your own religion. People get to the place where they don't believe in Jesus as the incarnate Son of God. They don't believe that they're sinners in need of a Savior. They look at people below their perceived level with very little love. The idea is in Gnosticism and modern-day mysticism as well, that if you want to find God, you look within because that's where God is. He's within you. And what you do physically is relatively meaningless because we're supposed to just learn from everything we do, every sin we commit, but we don't call it sin anymore. Matter is evil, so just let the body do whatever it wants to do. That has nothing to do with your own personal interior goodness. And this is being lived out in our society now without restraint, while people try to find the goodness inside of themselves. People wanted to live as rotten as they could and still feel good about themselves, and that's why they invented the system in the first place. Just concoct a sophisticated system that says, inside I'm good, inside I'm God. I met a man one time when I went over to his home to study the Bible with him, and just as soon as my seat hit the chair in his living room, he said, I don't want to shock you, but I am God. And by his definition, he was. He had the God life within him. One of the group of the Gnostics was known as the Docetics, which were an extreme group. The word dokeo means to seem. And they said that Jesus only seemed to have a physical body while he was here. It was an illusion. He was like an apparition. He wasn't really here in the flesh. He only seemed to be. The Serinthians, who were similar, said that the divine Christ came on the human Jesus for just a brief time from his baptism to the cross and then left before Jesus actually died. Bear this in mind. To say that Jesus was not God in human flesh is an outright denial of the substitutionary atonement. And if Jesus did not die for man as man, then we have no substitute. So there's a lot at stake here. They were denying that Jesus had a body. Can you imagine telling that to the Apostle John who lived with him for three years? That's why he starts this letter off the way he does. He says, our hands have handled. Gnosticism attacks the person of Jesus Christ and it attacks the idea of sin. It assaults the responsibility to love. It says, oh, in my inner person I have no sin, it's just my material body that's the problem. The Gnostics divided people into two classes, those who were capable of this higher life that they were talking about, and then the rest of us beastly people who were not capable of it. The imaginary elite Look down in disdain on the others. So, in writing this epistle, John exposes the false and reveals the true. These concepts cycle around about four different times in the letter. Interestingly, the word no in its various forms appears at least 37 times in this short epistle. By this we know, John will say again and again. Not by this we think or we hope or we wish or we feel, but by this 
we know. This is an epistle of certainty. And in the first four verses, he starts off with some great certainties. You and I live in a time when certainty and conviction about truth are not very well tolerated. Today's attitude, even among a lot of religious people who claim to be, believe the Bible, their attitude many times is, well, I'm just too humble to think that I could ever really know what the Bible actually means. And we get to the place where we're not certain of much of anything. But the Apostle John is an apostle of certainties, and this is a very certain epistle. He uses the word confidence several times, and he means boldness or assurance. John knows whereof he speaks, so he has confidence. He's certain about what he writes. The Bible exalts dogmatism in that sense. Boldness because one knows what the truth is. This is so contrary to today's mood as to make it seem almost insensitive and out of touch. But the Apostle John, by inspiration, normalizes it. We should know and we should have confidence. He starts with the living incarnate word who is the theme of the written word. We hope you'll join us for our next video.